The best way to be motivated is to do things that don't cost you so much. Your motivation is gonna come from motion. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. On a scale of one to 10, you put in sixes and sevens. In 2024, I'm gonna be able to run a seven minute mile for the first time in my life. Almost everything I do is very controllable and repeatable. A great man once said, every great run starts out with a great walk. I actually just made that up, but yeah, I think this is a great way to start. I'd like to try to explain something to you guys about motivation. I, I do talk about it quite a bit, but here's something I think that people don't know about motivation. The best way to be motivated to do stuff is to not have to have motivation to do it in the first place. So, or to really bring down the amount of motivation that you need. Example number one, I want to go to the gym starting on Monday. That's, that's a great idea. As it gets closer to Monday and it's now Saturday, you're like, oh, looks like Monday's filling up. It's kind of busy. Sunday rolls around. You're like, I don't have an hour and a half to train. I'm gonna wait till Tuesday. And then most likely it never happens. So let's really pull the amount of motive and motivation we need. Let's go down much lower. Let's just say to ourselves, I would love to get to the gym today and do a couple exercises for legs. I would love to go to the gym today and get in a couple sets of squats. Even if that gets dialed back, if it goes from squats to leg press, which it shouldn't, but if it goes from squats to leg press, because squats might require more motivation, that's still good. So you can talk yourself down, just don't talk yourself out all the way. So maybe you're on, maybe you, you're setting out to do a run. And you're like, I'm just gonna get out of the house, I'm just gonna put my goddamn shoes on, and I'm just gonna go for a goddamn walk. Maybe that's all you muster up, but at least try to run. Give yourself a chance. Give yourself a shot, okay? Move around. Feel how you're breathing for the day. Feel how you're doing for the day. Feel your body. Feel your arms and your legs, blood pumping. Give yourself a chance. Before you count yourself out with anything that has to do with motivation, give yourself a shot. Your motive, your motivation is going to come from motion. Once you get yourself in motion, once you get yourself in action, you're then going to be motivated. Get yourself to the gym and before you say that you're not motivated, do your first set of lat pull downs. Do your second set of lat pull downs. Do your third set of lat pull downs where you do a drop set and you go all in. You go light, medium, heavy with those warm ups. And on that heavy one, you do a drop set. You motivated or not, you're going to be motivated at that point. You're going to be motivated at that point. You're going to be breathing hard. You're going to be like, fuck it, man, I'm already here. You're going to hear from some speech from The Rock on your Instagram when you're scrolling through Instagram and you're gonna get fired up. Joe Rogan, David Goggins, Mark Smelly Bell, who knows who it will be. But I wanna get back to this idea. The best way to be motivated is to, not, is to do things that don't cost you so much. This, this, has, this is low cost, because I'm used to it, right? simple. And, you know, it's kind of like a jog going at a decent speed, but speed her up a bit. Speed her up a bit for 50 yards. Let's see. Pick up the knees, get some drive, get some twisting, head over foot. Stay loose.
I'm breathing. Breathing hard. I'm alive. Feel good. Motivation is gonna dump in. It just is. That's the way it be. That's the way it goes. So, they say motivation is fleeting. It's true, but I think you should bask in it every day. Find a way to get motivation. How do we get motivated? I told you already, you get motivated through motion. Get yourself moving, get yourself grooving, get yourself into a position where you're breathing hard. You're demanding something of yourself. And that motion, that motive will come out by eliciting this motion that's gonna cause an emotion, right? And over time, you're gonna be more motivated than ever. While keeping that in your mind, I want you to also consider the fact that everything you do shouldn't need such a high level of motivation. And when it does, ask yourself what the deal is with that and why does it feel that way? Why the fuck does it feel that way? Why is your motive for something so low? Do you not enjoy it anymore? It's possible. Well, let's see now. What makes the heart grow fonder? Anybody know? Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Miss a couple days, right? Miss a couple days. Some of you people that maybe are new in, newly in love or you had the luck of being in love with somebody before, how bad does it suck to miss them for even just a day or two days? A week feels like an eternity. And you realize how connected you are to that person. I still hate it when I'm not with my wife. I still hate it. I mean, not for just like parts of the day or whatever, but if she's gone for a handful of days or I'm gone, I hate that. I fucking hate it. But every time she's away, she comes back, makes me recognize how much I enjoy being around her. When I get done with this run, I get to go see her. We're gonna go hang out, going on a date. So absence away from something can really be helpful. Oh, I don't really have it anymore for running. I don't know, man. I, I think I burnt myself out. Well, burn yourself back in, bro. What the fuck? Burn yourself back in. Miss a couple days. Miss a week. But then when you go back to it, don't try to run five miles. Then when you run five miles, don't try to do an eight minute mile for five miles. Take her nice and easy. Nice and slow. Low, slow, walk, jog. What kind of motivation does this take? Walk for 10 seconds, jog for 10, right? Back and forth, grease in the groove. Getting yourself used to it, right? Anyway, that's some of my take on motivation. That's how I stay motivated, fired up every day to do the things that I do because I'm not doing them all out all the time. You do not need tens. We don't need tens. We don't need 100%. We don't need 10 out of 10 on everything all the time. Every day, 
on a scale of one to 10, you put in sixes and sevens. Add a zero to that six or that seven, it's what? 60, 70. Throw a line on top of that. Throw two little circles on there. And now we got 60 to 70%. That's about what you should do every day. So that you can do it every day. So you can push on it every day. But if you run, lift, and do carnivore on Monday, you're all fired up. You do a 16, eight fast cycle. By Thursday, you're already out. And that to me is cowardly. That to me is not greatness. We want to be great. The only way to be great is to be consistent. The only way to be great is to be good first. Being great is the act of consistently being good. That's all it is. Consistently being good. Consistently following through with what you said you were going to do. Constantly and consistently. Over and 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 over again. Just like beast mode. Remember beast mode? Want to run over a motherfucker's face? <laughs> over and over and over and over and over again. One of my favorite interviews. Sun's coming out. Hell yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Just kind of running. Not really sure of the pace, but I'm going to start to look at it a little bit. I don't obsess over this stuff too much. It's nice to see. I used to be at like, if I was gonna run for an hour, my total pacing, including like maybe taking a leak or changing my shoe or uh, tying my shoe or something, you know, my pace time would be, you know, 14 minutes or something a mile. Maybe there's some small break in there or something for a walk for a minute or something. But uh, yeah, it'd be like a 14 minute mile. Then it consistently got down to like 13 and then 12. Um, and it just, over time, it's gotten better and better. And now it's not, I can go and run five or six miles at like comfortably without it having like a negative impact on me like an 11 minute mile pace. By no means is that fast, but man, it's an improvement. That's what I'm into is improvement. I'm gonna make a lot of improvements in 2024 that I'm excited about. In 2024, I'm gonna be able to run a seven minute mile for the first time in my life. In 2024, hopefully I'm saying, I can't remember what I was saying. <laughs> yeah, 2024, I wanna run a seven minute mile for the first time in my life. I never really tried it. I think I could do it now, but uh, I don't wanna go and crush myself. But uh, consistently getting better at stuff. You're gonna see me be able to jump higher, move quicker, and I promise you, I'm telling you guys, I've been saying this for a while, you're gonna be flipping through and you're gonna say, who the fuck's that? And it's gonna be me, you bitches. It's gonna be me, motherfucker. They <laughs> say, Jesus H, Christ on a cross, the fuck has gotten into Mark Bell? And it's just gonna be improvement over and over again. Getting better, getting leaner, getting more handsomest, handsomer wrist, being less fat.
getting stronger on some pull-ups and body weight exercises, being able to jump higher, being able to run faster, and improving my strength. My strength right now isn't great, and it can easily be improved upon, so I'm even excited about that. I'm gonna get myself down to around 210 pounds, and I'm gonna be moving and doing shit that you never thought that I could do. And trust me, I understand. <laughs> I understand how everybody's going around thinking about me all day. I get it. But just some of the comments I see sometimes, some of the pe things people say, it fires me up. Some of the comments and some of the things people say, it fires me up. It gets me excited. I, I'm really pumped and, and excited to make some big time changes. And the way that I look at, the way that I, you know, people say, don't feed the trolls, right? The trolls on the internet. And they don't say, they say don't feed the trolls because you don't want them to keep making negative comments. But I embrace the negativity because I'm gonna chew that stuff up and I'm gonna use it as calories. I'm gonna use it as energy. I'm gonna utilize hate as a fourth macronutrient. And it's gonna be, it's gonna be me turning that energy into something positive. And it's an interesting thing to have fans on one side, and then have some negativity, and some hate on the other side. Um, I know full well, not everyone's gonna be excited about everything I post, especially because, you know, let's face it, sometimes I'm poking the bear, right? So I, I get it. And uh, yeah, I deserve, I can say, I can say I deserve the hate sometimes. Um, and trust me, it's not a focus of mine. It's just that I've, some people say don't look at the comments, right? And yeah, I don't really look at a lot of comments in general. I don't spend a lot of time doing it. But I am interested in people's opinions of different things I post or different things I say. It's just kind of fascinating to me, the observation of human behavior. I just kind of dig it. Um, so I'm always going to look at the comments, <clears throat> but it's like, I think people say, don't look at the comments because of what it could do to you. For me, I'm way stronger than that. <clears throat> I'm way stronger than not having the capability of looking at the comments, much like somebody might have a really hard time with weighing themselves. I weigh myself like twice a day, every day. It doesn't have a negative input on me, but for some other people, they need to be a little more cautious with that. For some people, seeing those numbers can hurt them or throw them off track. So maybe they have to weigh themselves less frequently. <clears throat> but this idea of never getting on the scale in the first place is not a great one. This idea of never look at the comments, never listen to criticism, comes from a place of thinking that you can't handle it. But I can. I can handle it. I was built for this shit. I was built for it. I was built to be a workhorse. I was built to be a person to deliver some messages for people. And I don't care if people think that that is like a ridiculous statement or it's cocky or something. I've never shied away from being a little arrogant. I think it has value. I've never been a person who really cared about being humble. I know how humble I am on the inside. I know what I'm humbled with and I don't feel like I need to be demoralized to be humbled as some people may say. Um, 
if people can't see, the people close to me can't see some humbleness and they can't see how much gratitude and appreciation I have for them, people that are close to me, people that work for me, family members, people that they know I love and care about, my children, like, it's just way too obvious, I think. I, I, uh, I try to, I try to spread things out amongst people I care about. And behind closed doors, I'm reaching out to a lot of people. A lot of people that I've had been in my life for a long time, that I still communicate with all the time. And so, I think kind of back to this idea of, you know, people talking about being humble and modest. I, uh, I don't love it. I really don't. I think uh, Barquan is the one who said, dominate humbly. And I, and I, I like that. And I, that message kind of resonates with me. Um, not to be too aggressive with your celebration, right? Of the things that you did or accomplished. At the same time, you should have every right to be proud. And you should have every right to be boastful. You should have every right, you know, like somebody may beat someone in a race and stick their tongue out. But you're right, you're faster than the other person. We should be able to do that sometimes with stuff. So we'll put our hands over our head and celebrate. We should be able to say, hey, you know what, that's funny, but I make more money than you. <laughs> we should be able to say stuff like that. It doesn't have to be hurtful. Um, it's just, just the way some shit is, right? And how could you not be humble in this world when you start to understand how incredibly competitive everything is? Like in terms of being an entrepreneur or something like that, you know, if you start to get yourself into comparing to other people, then you get yourself in a weird, weird spot. You get yourself in this compromised position where I don't know how good of an idea that is. However, if you're a new entrepreneur and you're looking up to like someone like Alex Ramosi, it might be kind of a cool idea. And it might be nice to, in the long run, you know, have maybe some of his goals be short of your North Star or something that you emulate. Those are cool things. But to compare him or anybody like that to yourself can sometimes be a mistake because it can be too, too overwhelming. And when I think of like the reasons why things aren't overwhelming for me, it's because I stay within my means. I don't overreach. I don't do a lot of things that are gonna be really, truly harmful to me. Some people might think I do, but trust me, I'm, pre I'm more reserved than you might think. Um, some know my story with the power lifting and those lifts weren't roll of the dice. The 1085 that I fell with was not a roll of the dice. I squatted like 1135 in training. Um, I squatted 1,080 in a previous contest. I was lined up. 1,085 was my second attempt. <laughs> Crushed like 1,035 in that meet as the opener. I was ready. I was ready to go. Even some of the big benches and stuff that I missed. I missed the 881 or 887, 400 something kilos, just shy. I think, I think it was the right side. Just shy of locking out that right side. Whoop. Yeah, 400, 400 plus kilo attempt. Just, you know, can't remember if it's right or left side. Just couldn't quite lock it out. But that wasn't overreaching either. I bench pressed 900 plus pounds many times off of boards in training 
video here <laughs> many times. That wasn't overreaching either. So I think, you know, kind of to loop this stuff back together, I think sometimes we have this idea that, um, you know, if you're, if you're not being conservative or if you're not, like that you're, if you're not humble, that you're not going to be conservative, that you're gonna be braggadocious and maybe make foolish decisions and not care about other people and not care about uh, other people's lives, other people's emotions. And I just haven't found that to be true. I actually think that it's, it's kind of cool to not be humble a little bit. It's cool to have a little, that's cool to have a little something extra about you that's different. Um, and when things are, things sometimes are, things sometimes are just factual. I mean, sometimes you're bigger than someone. Sometimes you're stronger than them. Sometimes you're faster than them. And if we're being honest, people aren't really equal. Like there's people that are better than other people. And you can say, hey, that's not a great mindset to think that you're better than somebody. <laughs> I disagree. I, I don't I don't agree. I think it's great to kind of think about it and be like, you know what? I'm like the best motherfucker that I know. And that doesn't have to be to your detriment. It can just be the fact that you feel like you're executing pretty well on a handful of things. You know, maybe it's a fucked up personality trait of mine, but and maybe uh, old Rosemary Bell gave me too much confidence and too much love. But it's just the way I look at things. And within that, I have full understanding that for many of you that are married and have children, it's my belief that my wife doesn't love me any more than your wife loves you for, you know, me having lots of followers, um, lots of money, or anything like that. Like all, like, normal relationship stuff being equal, your wife loves you just as much as my wife loves me. Your children, or more even. You know what I mean? I don't know your relationship. Could be better, right? Um, so, just because you feel so good about what you have going on and you maybe compare a bit to what's going on out there and say, thank God my life isn't like that. Thank God uh, I'm grateful for the life that I have and the things I'm able to do. I feel like I'm better off than that person. I think that's, I think that's normal. I really do. And I think it's just not talked about that much. Anyway, let's get back to this concept of not overreaching, being a little cautious with the overreach. Shit, we might be pumping out a Saturday school while I'm running. God damn, I am better than everybody. I fucking knew it. I fucking knew it. Anyway, overreach, overdoing things. Um, doing stuff you're not quite ready for. We're gonna walk just a bit so you take a moment to capture some sunlight. I'm on a run here in Davis, California. It's beautiful outside. And I uh, always try to come prepared with proper attire, tank top on. Remember what the tank top's for. Tank tops in case I gotta take a shit go inside to a public place, take a dump on the run. Or sometimes, you know, you need to buy something, buy some water, rehydrate or whatever. A constant thing that's been beneficial for all of our health has been intaking enough protein, but also intaking quality protein. And that's why we've been partnering with Good Life Proteins for years now. Good Life not only sells Piedmontese beef, which is our favorite beef, and the main reason why it's our favorite is because they have cuts of meat that have higher fat content, like their ribeyes and their chuck eyes, but they also have cuts of meat like their flat iron. 
Andrew, what's the macros on the flat iron? Yeah, dude. So the flat iron has 23 grams of protein, only two grams of fat, but check this out. Their grass fed sirloin essentially has no fat and 27 grams of protein. There we go. So whether you're dieting and you want lower fat cuts or higher fat cuts, that's there. But you can also get yourself chicken. You can get yourself fish. You can get yourself scallops. You can get yourself all types of different meats. And I really suggest going to Good Life and venturing in and maybe playing around with your proteins. I mean, going back to the red meat, there's pecania. All kinds of stuff. chorizo sausage. There's maple bacon. Wow. That stuff's incredible. <laughs> the maple bacon is yes, so good. Yes, maple bacon is really good. Yo, my girl put those in these uh, bell peppers with uh, a steak oh, and chicken. Yes. And oh my God, it was so good. But either way, guys, protein is essential. And the Good Life is the place where you can get all of your high quality proteins. So Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, you can head over to goodlifeproteins.com and enter promo code POWERPROJECT to save 20% off your entire order. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Give that a tuckaroo into these Wallaco shorts. These are the best shorts in the world. I have my phone in my pocket right here on the side. Can pull it out like a holster, Whoosh, right? And not only that, but the pocket is water resistant. It's got pockets on both sides. Uh, let's see, I'm not sure if it's these shorts or if it's the other pair I have. But yeah, there's pockets on both sides to hold stuff. And like, you know, running with the phone isn't that bad, but it's like kind of annoying sometimes. So it's nice to have the extra pockets. And I'm actually gonna, gonna go naked as I get over to the track over here. Oh, this is a trip. Walking this way. <laughs> Hockey jersey style. Lululemon is amazing, by the way. This is a tank top I that they sent me. It's really weird, you know, uh, being famous like I am. These companies, they just send me stuff. Like, I go on their site, I put stuff in my cart, and I use my Apple Pay, and next thing you know, it's like... Holy shit, this keeps sending me stuff. It's like, Lululemon, get off of my fucking dick, okay? Like, I know I'm popular, but shit, bro. You're sending me way too much stuff. So anyway, that's a huge problem. All right, we got to get back to this overreaching topic. I'm overreaching in my pants right here. These shorts also have a little tie-off, which is nice. Sometimes, like... When it gets to be summertime here in Sacramento, you really start sweating. But the best, you know, and sometimes it's good to have the shorts to be secure. I'm gonna go right through here, right through this fence. Let's uh, actually go. So the best feature of these bad boys is these longer shorts underneath. And I know some of you short, short fans might be like, man, I wish they weren't so long. You can hork them up a little bit. Let me go over here. Go this way. The best feature about these shorts is this, is this kind of spandex layer underneath. Um, for you, those of you with like bigger, more jacked legs, like it really sucks to get that chub rub. And in the summertime, I don't know exactly all of what's going on, but I don't think anybody does. But shit just gets like sticky and sweaty. And then I start getting a burn here and it almost doesn't matter like the material, the underwear. The only solution when you start to build, build out some big quads and you're someone that squatted over a thousand pounds at one point is we need to like have all these surfaces super slippery. <laughs> and so Wallaco makes these shorts that I think look nice, they're great for training. They got a cool logo. They're nice and stretchy, good material. And they just feel amazing when I'm running. A little bit of compression, but not, you know, sometimes some of these things, the compression is so intense. It's like way too much. And this is kind of perfect. Again, it's got the two pockets on the side and this, you know, blocking you from chub rub is great. And if you're somebody that likes the shorter shorts, you can just kind of hike them up a little bit. I haven't had any problems if I, hoist them up a little bit, give it a little bit of a diaper. Anyway, back to the action, back to the running. Oh, 
hard thing about being in a college town is like, every time I go running around here with my shirt off, I have to tell all these college girls, like, listen, I'm married. And they start running behind me and start chasing me. And some of them are pretty fast. Really, really a fucking pain in the ass. Anyway, back to overreaching. I like to go for it with stuff. You know, I do. I, I like to... I like to do a lot of things. I like to build businesses. I like to... I like to train hard. You know. But if you've been listening to the message the whole time, I oftentimes will talk about how I don't even really think that things should be that hard. I think that things should be simple. And I think they should be kind of kept, for the most part... Like 95% of your work should be in a 60 to 70% range. How's that math? <laughs> but think about it. Think about every workout you've ever done and think about all the warm up reps, the cool down reps, all the times that you spent doing stuff in between exercises where you're resting or stretching or doing something passive. How many times were your workouts fully like throttled up? It really just shouldn't be that many times in my opinion. It just shouldn't be. There's no reason for it to be. There's no extra benefit from that really. Um, maybe make an argument at certain times, you know, certain cycles, right? Maybe for a month, push everything a little bit more, you know, something like that. But uh, for the most part, a large percentage of your training, things should be simple. Look at these people are trotting around, right? They're just running around. No one's going real fast. And if they do go real fast, how many sets are they going to do that? Probably not many. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so if training works that way, if it works that way to build your body, maybe life works that way. Maybe relationships work that way. I think a lot of times some relationships that sometimes try to get forced where someone ends up with a broken heart, they're trying to make something work that wasn't going to work anyway. Right? So it's just another example of no matter what we're talking about, it's got to be lower percentage of intensity so you can make it work for a long why don't you make it work for a long time so be careful of overreaching and if you do overreach just be real mindful of it like why are you overreaching what's it for what are the results you're looking to get from it is it going to actually benefit you the way that you think it is for you to do five plates on each side on a leg press right? Is it really going to have the net outcome that you're searching for? A lot of times the answer is no. It's probably not. You'd be better off probably going with a better and deeper range of motion, using less weight, doing the exercise correctly, and taking your time. Not only will your legs get bigger if that was part of your goal, um, but You'll get stronger faster that way. You'll get stronger faster if you move slower and more methodical. You will grow your business bigger and faster if you're more calculated. If you work 90% intensity on and in your business, you work at it. And, and you feel like it's hard and it's intense and you're in there every day slugging it out trading your hours for dollars that is the worst way to try to build grow and scale the worst way it's the fastest way fastest way to more stress and probably not a lot more money and who the fuck's into that <laughs> right nobody I'm gonna outrun my cameraman. Might be able to get a good V 
view of some head over foot with this line here. So as I'm doing this run, and as I'm teaching the Saturday school, we're also teaching technique over here, utilizing this yellow stripe on the UC Davis campus to head over foot it. And something I gotta remember is, I gotta move my arms a little more. I just feel awkward, I feel like I'm like, running in a weird way. Pace feels really good today though. I have to remember to bring my elbows past the midline of my body when I run. It might be useful for you to do that in your walks as well. Actually, you know what? Let's go this way, Ryan. Go down this way a bit. It might be useful for you to do this even when you walk. Take your arm and get your elbows out in front of your body a bit, even when you walk stone cold Steve Austin it a bit. You don't have to Vince McMahon it. You don't have to Vince it, okay? Just stone cold it. Da -na, da -na, da -na, da -na. But this arm swing actually works your, your core and your lower back tremendously. This is a fantastic core exercise and spinal exercise. Spinal. Remember that famous Tyson clip? So now when I'm running, jogging, scooch the elbows in front. Scooch them in front of the body. <clears throat> See our boy Kipchoge, elbows tight. He's kind of here, almost actually, I'm sorry, down here more. Almost look like he's rubbing his heart. But his elbow, when he's at full tilt, <laughs> he's doing like under a four minute and 20 second mile for 26 miles. Craziest thing I ever heard. But he's kind of here. But anyway, just in general, you know those elbows moving. And not only forward, but back too, right? So we sometimes forget and like, if you're a jacked up guy like me, that's done a lot of bench pressing, those shoulders don't move so great. Anyway, back to overreaching. You may have seen, I did the Boston Marathon. Before I did the Boston Marathon, I did a half marathon. <clears throat> Before I competed in the Boston Marathon. Before I signed up for it, I looked at it and I almost thought, you know what, I'm gonna do this a year and a half from now. And I pulled away from that idea because I was like, eh, whatever it was, like six or eight months, that's enough time. And you wanna know what? It was not enough time. I don't regret the decision, but I still got murdered because in my research of the Boston Marathon, I didn't realize I was already, I was already fairly committed. I didn't sign up yet, but I was fairly committed by talking to this uh, fundraising company. And I really felt like I'd disappoint them if I didn't do it. And I found out about the hills and how many of them there are and where they hit you. I can tell you guys right now, even with the shape I'm in now, I would still not be able to really do the Boston Marathon. I'd have to, I'd need, at this point, with the fitness I have now, I'd still need a year to really train for it. Because there's some deadly hills. It is tough. For me, it was tough. And I also, when I ran, I was 240. I was still 235, 240. And now I'm kind of 220. But anyway, even considering that, it's like, that was kind of an overreach, right? But I think sometimes people are overreaching so hard that it could really be really hurtful and detrimental to their life. Now, I have overreached before. I took crazy amounts of drugs before, testosterone, trenbolone, uh, 
growth hormone, insulin. I've taken all those things and I've definitely taken them to an extreme to where, <clears throat> yeah, I guess I could say, I don't think that high dose testosterone is really that detrimental. However, I had a lot of other practices surrounding that that weren't good, that weren't a good idea. And so, <laughs> I'm a real stickler for the rules. <laughs> that was kind of weird. Should have maybe elbowed him. But, uh, you know, so I have done stuff that maybe was an overreach and that's why I'm preaching against it is because I think that if you are gonna overreach, again, it should only represent a small percentage of what you're doing. I knew full well that my gains, my progress, weren't gonna come from drugs. They were gonna come from dedication along with the drugs, right? So even though some of that stuff may have been something that might put me, we'll loop it around, might be something that might have, may have put me in a compromised position. It also might be something that uh, maybe it did take a few years off my life, but I'm, uh, I'm understanding that idea and I accept full responsibility for all of that. And I, and I, I was aware that I was overreaching at the time. So if you're thinking about building a business or rolling the dice with something and you're trying to get yourself to the next level on something, I'm not saying you can't ever overreach. I would just say, be really conscious of it. Uh, for me, for powerlifting, I remember seeing Steve Goggins squat 1102 at the WPO finals. And I looked at my wife and said, the difference between that guy and me right now is that <laughs> I don't take performance enhancing drugs. I'm not big enough. And I really felt that way. I felt that that was true. And I wasn't like some weenie person that didn't have any genetics or work ethic. So I've heard people say shit like that before. If you're someone that's taking supplements or vitamins or anything to help move the needle in terms of your health, how do you know you really need them? And the reason why I'm asking you how do you know is because many people don't know their levels of their testosterone, their vitamin D, all these other labs like their thyroid, and they're taking these supplements to help them function at peak performance. But that's why we've partnered with Merrick Health for such a long time now, because you can get yourself different lab panels like the Power Project panel, which is a comprehensive set of labs to help you figure out what your different levels are. And when you do figure out what your levels are, you'll be able to work with a patient care coordinator that will give you suggestions as far as nutrition optimization, supplementation, or if you're someone who's a candidate and it's necessary, hormonal optimization to help move you in the right direction so you're not playing guesswork with your body. Also, if you've already gotten your lab work done but you just want to get a checkup, we also have a checkup panel that's made so that you can check up and make sure that everything is moving in the right direction if you've already gotten comprehensive lab work done. This is something super important that I've done for myself. I've had my mom work with Merrick. We've all worked with Merrick just to make sure that we're all moving in the right direction and we're not playing guesswork with our body. Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, that's over at MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project. And at checkout, enter promo code Power Project to save 10% off any one of these panels or any lab on the entire website. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. But I literally took anabolics trained for like eight years and nearly squatted the exact same amount as that guy. So I, I knew that that was something that my love of powerlifting and maybe we could say some misconceptions in my head, I felt that like in order for me to play the sport of powerlifting the way I wanted to, that I had to overreach a bit. And I had to take performance enhancing drugs and so I did it, and it worked out the way that it did. But I was fully aware that testosterone can have a negative impact in large amounts on your heart, your lipid profile. Um, it can cause some like hyper uh, 
let's see, what's the word? It can cause you to be like oversexed, I guess you'd say. Like you just, your testosterone so high, you want like way too much of it, which is not great if you're a married guy. Um, it, it, can, it can cause problems, right? So you have to kind of consider everything when you take these drugs. And I knew about all this stuff. I knew it could cause liver damage, kidney damage. And I did my best to try to figure out how can I kind of skirt my way around some of that, right? How can I make sure I'm healthy? And I took a lot of precautions. After every meet, I'd always lose weight. Um, I'd get blood pressure checked. I'd donate blood. I'd, I started to get blood work done, even you know, as of like 10 years ago. So that's a big reason on why I'm able to still do all the stuff that I do is because I've been aware and alert this entire time of the positives and the negatives that came along with heavy lifting and performance enhancement that I may have taken to an extreme level. And when I think of business, I think of relationships and all these other things, I think it's just so relatable to a lot of that. I built my strength slowly over a long period of time um, before I ever took performance enhancing drugs. I bench pressed 225 for 40 reps in a uh, combine that I did for a uh, junior college that I played for. I played for uh, the Albany uh, Vikings back in the day. And I also then transferred and played another year at Santa Monica City College where I played with Steve Smith and Ocho Cinco. And even though I was on the team with those maniacs, I was still one of the faster guys on the team. Now I wasn't as fast as Steve Smith or Ocho Cinco, but I was probably like fourth or fifth fastest person on the team. We had some blazers. That's some really fast people. So I was able to do a lot of that stuff naturally. I bench pressed 500 pounds on a floor press at Westside Barbell. And that was before I took, before I took performance enhancing drugs. It was kind of a sketchy lift. It was a gym lift, but 500 pounds nonetheless. So I was able to do some cool stuff without it. It's just that the implementation of that at a certain point, just became evident, you know? And again, it could have been my own, own misconceptions. I'm willing to accept that too. But because I've, I've had this kind of zoomed out view of a lot of the things I was doing and a lot of things I currently do, I don't feel like I'm overreaching. I don't feel like anything I do is crazy. Whereas some people might think like, fuck man, Mark Bell's kind of crazy. <laughs> I certainly don't feel that way. I certainly don't feel that way. I feel like almost everything I do is very controllable and repeatable. And right now, even though I'm doing multiple things at one time, I'm not sure if this is accurate. Well, it says I'm moving pretty good today, 1020. Yeah, I mean, I'm humming through this, talking, working, breathing, shooting podcasts, running, doing all things at the same time. I guess that is one area where I could say that there's intensity is with the frequency at which I do stuff. And the way that I do multiple things at a time might be an intense thing for most people. We'll go this way. So I do a lot. I do a lot of things kind of simultaneously, I guess. But I, you know, I think a lot of people do. Like. A lot of people will go on a walk and 
get hop on a business call at the same time. To me, this isn't any different. This is very similar. Um, what I would say about that though too is I'm able to handle a lot because I do a lot. I'm fit. I'm fit enough for it. You know, I just ran a couple miles and now I gotta, you know, I get an opportunity here to run a couple miles back. Back to the uh, studio, back to the gym over there. And really, all this feels to me is like, it just feels good. I am aware, like, when I start running back from somewhere, I'm like, in my head, I'm like, oh man, <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, only halfway back, right? And I know that I'll feel this uh, as I get closer to our destination, but I like that feeling. I like that feeling of, Biting off not more than I can chew. I like biting off something that's substantial and realizing I have an opportunity just to take another bite. And I think that's something that's helped me with my success. I'm not a badass. I'm not a tough guy. Um, I am willing and accepting of the fact that uh, that my genetics are good. Like both my brothers were always very strong and like I can accept all that and I'm fine with that. But the gifts that I, were give, I was given or the, uh, yeah, just the genetics that I have have just made, made these opportunities and situations maybe come to me a little easier than maybe the next person. But again, I don't feel like most of this stuff's hard mainly because of the amount of work that I do. And again, the genetics that I have may have supplied me with the ability to handle a little bit more than the next person, even at a young age or something like that. Because when I was a kid and I got into boxing, we'll go uh, left up here. When I got into boxing, I would go and just, I would run before school, actually go straight. So yeah, before, when I was a kid, I remember looking at a strength training program and uh, it was a Bulgarian system. The Bulgarian, Bulgarian weightlifters utilized it. And they trained three times a day. And I remember being like, shit, man, I can't do that because I have school. So I was trying to straight. <laughs> yeah, I remember kind of being disappointed. I'm like, man, I can't do that because I got school. And I remember like, oh, but summertime's coming up. So as soon as the summer hit, I was able to switch from working out before school and after school to working out before breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Even as like a 15 year old. And then I remember when I was boxing, um, it was hard because I was, uh, I played some like, I was in some like rec league basketball. I did a bunch of other stuff and I just remember I was like, when am I gonna have the time to freaking like get any road work in for boxing? I only boxed like twice a week. Um, it was at a powerlifting gym that I went to. So it was super convenient. I'd power lift for about an hour, 40 minutes. Mainly just do my main lifts not do any of the assistance exercises and then go box. And I really fell in love with it. But boxing sucks if you don't have any conditioning. So even just to hit the bag and hit gloves and to just get into some level of sparring, it takes a lot of, takes a lot of fitness. And so I remember I would run before, <laughs> I would run before school. I'd wake up at like 4.30, 5 o'clock and go out for a run. So I kind of been fortunate. I don't know, like that might be a partially genetic thing too. Um, but anyway, everything I've ever done, there's always been, even though there might not seem to be like a rhyme or reason sometimes of what I do, everything's like low and slow. 
Like you saw me do a couple of burpees today. I think I did like three. Well, I was just thinking about the other day. I was like, you know what? I'm pretty explosive with a movement like burpees. I should bring those back in. I like the movement. It's one of the toughest movements you can do in a gym. So I was thinking, let me, I like, I like the amount of movement there is. There's no exercise that you can do that has more movement than that. So I was like, you know what? It'd be cool to do a burpee with like jumping over something or onto something. It'd be nice to build up some skill with that. So you saw me just today spring into just a couple of them. And you're gonna see me do more of them. But where did that come from? You might think it came out of nowhere, but it certainly didn't. I've been jumping. I've been doing uh, jump rope, right? I've been doing some exercises on the ground and all that connects and adds up to something that looks like a burpee in some way. So I know people might not always love the message. Maybe they want to hear some story about how I was on Joe Rogan, then my business went through the roof or that I uh, made a movie with my brother, not launched my business, but nothing. All those things were helpful. I've been on Joe Rogan twice. I was in Bigger, Stronger, Faster. I'll bring it, be in my brother's new movie coming up. And all those things will help, but I've never had one thing be like this huge blip. Been on Tom Segura's podcast, uh, Tim Ferriss's podcast. Done a lot of cool stuff that's pretty big in terms of like media. Nothing crazy huge. I mean, I guess Rogan's crazy huge. Um, but not like national TV or too many things like that. But again, none of those things have been this huge jump. Everything I've done has been low, slow, and methodical. Low, slow, and methodical. Kind of just doing shit for a long time. Over and over again. One foot in front of the other. Step by step continuously over weeks, months, years, and decades. And then someone will say, oh my God, I love what you do. I love the YouTube videos you make. I love the slingshot. And you're like, kind of like, oh my God, it's talking to me. Like, That's so cool. Cause that was never the intention. The intention was this. The intention was strength is never a weakness. Weakness is never a strength. And because I know that, I wanna make the world a better place to lift. And in my mission to make the, better, make the world a better place to lift, I knew the only way I was gonna do that is to make myself as strong as possible. So selfishly, I created Super Training Gym to make the world a better place to live because I knew if I was able to have others that could help me and if I was able to help them, I could coerce them into helping me <laughs> via helping them and via helping you and I can make the world a better place to live through that mission statement and through the North Star, which is that strength is never weakness and weakness is never strength. It's been a plan the whole time. There was no monetization. There was no, there was no thought process to become rich off these things. But there was a thought process to be fucking rich off these things. To be strong off of this stuff. And to build a life for myself, my family, and maybe even generations to come. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode. I think this will be a uh, podcast. We can use this as a Saturday school or maybe we'll just rip it up there on one of the YouTube channels. But thanks to all of you that are fans, all of you that stick by me. It really does mean a lot. Uh, I love all of you. I love running into you guys. So don't be one of those people that say, hey, I saw you running in Davis, but I didn't want to stop you. Stop me. Say hello. Say what's up. 
take a selfie with me give me a fist bump i actually enjoy it you see me out at dinner even if i'm with my family come say hello come say what's up i'd love to hear from you strength is never weakness weakness is never strength catch you guys later if you enjoyed this episode which i know you did because you got this far then click this one right here because you'll enjoy this one just as much and if you're choosing to still listen to me currently as i'm telling you to go over here and watch this video well hey that just means you like the sound of my voice <laughs> and well i'll just keep seducing you right here <laughs>